Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 240-240-240. How you doing? How you feeling, mother? Huh? Hope, hope you're well, man. Hope you're good. You good? You good? You good? Nice. Me? I'm feeling amazing. I'm feeling great. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling banging. I'm feeling fresh. I'm feeling clean. Just got back from the gym. As you can tell from my hands, they're all flipping, you know, scabbed up and shit, right? Um, pulling loads of weights, pushing loads of weights. Unfortunately, I meant to do the back squats today, but the machine, sorry, the squat rack was occupied. Um, some dude was on there for about an hour straight doing all these exercises. Another dude jumped on there just when I was about to jump on there. When that guy left, another guy jumped in front of me. I didn't want to get into the whole argument thing. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to leave it. I'm going to come back here, do a, do a podcast, and then do my little five-mile run after I finish work. You know, just forget it. I could have probably done some air squats to finish it off, but I thought, you know what? I'm already doing a two a day today, so I'm just going to, you know, bang it out, um, do a couple of, um, what did I end up doing? I ended up doing some overhead presses, some deadlifts, some um, chest presses with uh, dumbbells and shit, and that was pretty cool. Or, put, well, yeah, kind of like a um, bench bench press with dumbbells sort of vibe, because of course, the bench press is occupied as usual, you know? Constant... Um, the gym thing is good, but it's like once you, there's a window, you have to go in, right? You have to go in just enough. You have to go early enough in that window. So for instance, if I go out, when I go at six, I'm perfectly fine to get on a squat rack, get on a bench press and, and roll out. The moment I get there for about half six or seven, six forty five is the moment that everyone else wakes up. Cause I tend to, gym is probably a, a accurate representation of just everyday life in it. Right. Um, the, the winners, right. Are the ones that get there really early. Right, the ones that are going to achieve, that are going there, I've got a tight schedule, they don't fuck around, they're there super early. But there's not a lot of us, right? There's not a lot of people that can get up. Because to get to gym at 6 a.m., you have to wake up at what, half five, right? Because it's like a 10 minute walk to get to my gym, which is a nice little walk, listen to a podcast or listen to an audio book or just, you know, just listen or just have nothing on and just kind of um, meditate as you're kind of walking across to the gym. But to get there at six o'clock when they're opening the actual doors is, you know, you have to you have to wake up at half five. So you have to be prepared. You have to wake up. That means the day before you got to sleep early. That means you don't have to drink. That means you have to eat well. You have to. I mean, there's loads of things you have to do prior to the gym that kind of eliminates quite a lot of people out of the equation. But waking up at six thirty, waking or getting to the gym at six thirty at seven isn't that difficult. Most people can do it, even if you stayed up until twelve watching stuff at, on Netflix and stuff. We can. Everyone can generally get to a gym around six thirty, seven o'clock. So you have to make sure you get there. Bam, or six o'clock, or if you get there any time after today, I got there what like ten, no, fifteen minutes past six. All of a sudden, everything went out. Of the everything went out of sync. Um, only the, um, only the what do you call it? Only the deadlift platforms were empty. The bench was occupied. Both squat racks were occupied. So I kind of essentially had to do my my um, overhead presses on the on the deadlift thing, and my deadlifts of course there too. Um, I couldn't do any back squats there, but it's just annoying. You know, it's just annoying to do in those kind of areas. But you know. Say la vie, say la vie, say la vie. What can you do? Um, bit by bit, you know, you kind of learn your procedure. You kind of, so you kind of learn your schedule and where you should go, when you should go and stuff and make it easy for yourself. Because again, like I said, I like to be a ninja in the gym. I don't like to hang around. I just like to do, because I could have just waited for the dude to finish on the squat rack, but I wasn't going to hang around for another half an hour for some dude to finish. And then I got a damn jump on it myself. Another half an hour, add another hour to my workout. That then impedes my podcast. It then impedes the time I go to work. It's all kind of, you know, it's all very, very tightly controlled. The time that we have in this world but again we don't have much time you have to control your time and make sure you get the most out of it but also you can't take life too seriously because we don't have much time on this on this earth you have that much time you have, this, you have fun enjoy yourself all this sort of stuff um yeah yeah maybe maybe not who knows but anyway here we are back in a hot seat thank you again for tuning in as per usual if you were listening via the um, podcast app leave me a five star review that would go amazing subscribe and all that malarkey if you're li- watching via youtube give this video a nice thumbs up people can find it leave me a comment let me know what you think of the topics that i speak about um i cover loads of things that i found on the internet some topical subjects some stuff concerning streetwear some stuff concerning technology um art electronic music clubbing culture just general stuff i see in and around the world um so yeah if you like that sort of stuff then tune then stay in stay in stay, stay tuned in right stay tuned in is that what people say on tv and on radio yeah um keep yourself locked in as we go through all these topics i've got noted on my little notepad and we just keep carrying on until the hour mark has passed and then i boom stop it upload it head off to work and then by the time you guys are hearing this i should be somewhere having my lunch on the way back home <laughs> somewhere along that kind of line so yeah let's get straight into it let's not waste any more time and start getting to some topics let's see let's see let's see let's see so um 
number one, right? This is a this is an interesting topic just because I've seen it just today and I just want to expand on it. But I'm sure you guys are aware that um, Meghan Markle, um, the uh, Prince Harry's wife, has um, taken part or ha- they've kind of had done a, a concentrated rollout because they're part of a documentary of filming at ITV. But it's, it, it looks as if Meghan Markle's finally had enough of the British tabloids constantly you know prying into her life ripping off pe- from piece by piece whether it's stuff to do with her dad her brother her mom her family the way that she conducts herself the amount of private planes they take there's always a story that comes around with the mega Markle, right and i never really got it again i'm not um i'm not the biggest fan of the royal family look well, not i'm not the biggest of royal family um i don't know groupie or whatever or stan i don't I, but i don't really have a problem with them i think um as royal families go as royalty go in general they're quite you know they're not problematic in that respect they kind of keep their nose clean for the most part there might be some scandals going on underneath the surface i'm not aware of but again you have to be quite involved in that scene to know what's going on and maybe part of message boards and reddits for and reddit subreddits and, and subreddits and all that sort of stuff but from the outsiders from the kind of general public point of view they keep themselves to themselves they don't really involve themselves in, in more things than they shouldn't have shouldn't do and for for the most part I don't know. They don't really impede my life, or they don't really make me um, aggrieved at the um, high, at the kind of you know, at the um, unlimited amounts of wealth that they m- might have, or anything that other people might have do. Right? I don't really care to have respect. And the mega Markle thing, I never got either because you know Prince Harry isn't really next in line for the throne. Um, he's always kind of been a bit of a wild child of the royal family, anyway. Um, he's always been part of you know on the front page of the of the papers with any other scandal he's going through when he was young, and he was kind of acting out a little bit. So I wasn't that surprised when he went out and kind of, you know, essentially um, went out of the family to go and, you know, meet his his next wife and married Meghan Markle, who was at that time a Hollywood actress or, you know, she t- took part in that TV series called Suits, is where I know her from. So I wasn't that surprised, right? He went out and got some and got hooked up to, hooked up with some American um, actress, right? She didn't really seem that big of a deal to me, right? The fact that she was mixed race, again, didn't seem that big of a deal to me because it's Prince Harry, right? He's always been a bit, um, he's always kind of... Um, uh, walked to the to beat of his own drum. He kind of done his own thing. So I didn't really, it didn't really make that much beef. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't really get it. Um, the Prince William thing when he married his wife, you know, that made sense. You know, he was a little, he was always kind of the perfect child. It seemed like of the family in that respect. He kind of you know towed the party line and did his thing. No problem. Do your thing. But the Meghan Markle thing I never really got because you never really heard much of, from her for the first couple of years that they were dating or they were together. You never heard a pipsqueak out of her. Like, honestly, I never heard a single thing of Meghan Markle, like, speaking when she was with Prince Harry. Now, that, that probably had to do with the fact that she was probably under some sort of training, I'm assuming, some sort of royal training where, I don't know, or maybe there was a, there's a way that they kind of um, coach new partners of um, the royalty, right, that kind of come from the outside world or who are not blue bloods, quote unquote. Maybe there's a way that they, they do it in terms of they kind of tell you to kind of go quiet on the media and not put anything and just kind of you know um let them kind of control the narrative or your communication in terms of training because i'm sure there's a way of talking there's a way of kind of carrying yourself that is very particular to the royal family so maybe that was part of the reason but again i didn't hear nothing from her but then every but then for some reason within that year that she was completely quiet or a year and a half there was story after story coming out of her now most of it had to, was maybe the fault of her family right i remember the bit thing of her dad acting out and you know running around giving interviews and shit like you know that was a bit weird um but again you know we can't help we can't help the family that we're born into she's got some psycho psycho people in her family we've all got that those people in our our family again no big deal but again i I, I guess if you're the media um having any kind of insight on the person that you're kind of following who isn't giving you any light who isn't giving you any replies who isn't responding to your request for interviews is quite um alluring right you're going to just jump on it especially if you're after the clicks i get it but it just kept going on, right? Even with the tabloids, again, uh, paper after paper, paper. Um, front page after front page, again, Mega Marco, Mega Marco. I was like, Jesus Christ, you guys, like, leave this girl alone. Like, what's she done to you? And then suddenly now, I think it's reached her head and she's finally had enough. And they released a statement recently, a really um, hard hitting statement, where they kind of spoke about the perils that they've gone through, the trouble they've gone through, raising a young family and having to go through, you know, young family, but also being under the, the, uh, the um, scrutiny of the media. And it's been a pretty, it got pretty well received. I think some people had a lot of sympathy for it. And then to back it up, they've now released a documentary that I haven't seen actually, but a clip's been going around of Meghan Markle basically talking, which I'm going to play to you guys in a minute. And it basically, you know, she basically expounds upon all the points that they kind of spoke about in the statement. The funny thing, there is the reaction. Um, I think there has been, I don't know what it is about media or about social media or in general, where there's a bit of a detachment. There's a, there's a, there's this thing where people are very, quick to be critical of people in 
high out positions or or have a level of notoriety or celebrity attached to their name very critical of them right because you know their defense that oh this is what you signed up for which is again is a very um weird statement to throw out there but imagine if we if we buy that line cool it's what i've signed up for so they're very quick to point out the deficiencies of this person scrutinize for them for this uh, chastise them for that blah 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 but then when that person reacts like a human and breaks down acts out replies really negatively or whatever they then use that as a reason to kind of chastise them more so there's a way of like they like i think in most interactions even with your friends if you point the finger and you chastise your friend a lot and you just you know keep brabbing on about what bad they've done and they kind of act out you can't then turn around and say hey you need to calm down and take it easy right you just spent a uh, 20 minutes telling them how shitty their life is and how shitty life decisions they've made in their life and how everything they're doing is wrong and why that outfit is bad and why this is that and where they why they're going there why spend the money on this if you do that to somebody most people human beings they're gonna react right most human beings aren't gonna be able to just stomach or especially if it's someone that you don't know right for your friends is not even a good example because you know your friends when it's just a random stranger coming up to you and give and telling you their opinion on what on your life decisions you're not going to react well to it right most people aren't going to react well to it so then when Meghan Markle decides to react strongly towards those kind of things or you know has a a, a weird reaction to it people get a bit funny and it made me think about that some um, Korean that k-pop singer that committed suicide recently right by all accounts she'd you know told had let it be known that a lot of the criticism she received from the media or from the public, which I read through, was, you know, some of it was justified because of the stuff that she said, or whatever, whatever it may be. But she did let it be known that it was getting to her, right? She was becoming depressed and it was kind of affecting her mental health. And in an era now where everyone's kind of attuned or is more aware of mental health issues, it's very strange that people are very quick to kind of chastise somebody. But then when they then react or they then go and do something fatal like that K-pop singer and commit suicide, suddenly... The same people that are chastising them are completely quiet and don't take any responsibility behind some of the actions that might lead to that. Right now, we're not. No one. No one can sit here and say, "Oh, one person's critical. One person's critical column in the Sun or the Daily Mail about Meghan Markle is going to lead into depression." Not one thing. Not one. One. One plus one doesn't equal two. But these things are going to all add to someone's state, mental state, right, and how they react and how they are. And for a long time. I'm not sure if it's me, but especially recently, so I've taken notice. Again, I don't really read all these stories, but whenever I'm in a supermarket and, I, and I'm standing in a self-checkout unit, I'm always next to the racks where the magazines are. So I always constantly see, like, I don't know, who do you see? Like Jordan, um, Meghan Markle. Who else they love to have on the front paper? Oh. There's, there's, there's about three and they rotate. They rotate these stories again and again and again, the same sort of people they rotate, right? And I think recently I've, I've noticed a very empty look in her eye. You know when you're like, I'm not going to say that she's on anything, but you know when you're kind of just like, life is just a bit of a blur. You're just trying to get through things. You're not really present where you are. She always looks a little bit shabby to me, which is hard because she's a very, very attractive woman, very beautiful. Um, you know, she seems like a really sweet girl inside and out, but I've, I've, I've seen a very empty look in her eyes lately. I'm not sure if it's just me. And after watching this clip on, on Twitter, it kind of made more sense now because she's going through absolute hell. And... Um, of course, you know, there's going to be detractors by it. And one detractor about it suddenly today has been Katie Hopkins, who I'm sure a lot of British people are familiar with, a former um, contestant of The Apprentice who's kind of gone, like, she's pivot, Like, she's basically a female Milo, right? Doesn't go too far as Milo, but essentially just like a, a big troll. And it kind of got me thinking about haters and how how that kind of occupation, how that has become now an occupation. Instead of it be becoming a slur, like, in the same way, like, you know, I think about Hypebeast. When I was writing for Hypebeast back in the day, I was embarrassed to give out my business card, my Hypebeast business card, right, when I was writing for them. Nowadays, uh, being a Hypebeast is sort of like a badge of honor. It's not, like, looked at as some sort of, like, you know, it's not a disparaging term. When you watch stuff like Full Size Run, some kids say that they're hype. Some guys that go in there, like, you know, they put, especially on the YouTubers, they're not ashamed to say they're hypebeast, right? They're only going to buy stuff when it's limited or when it's, you know, scarcely available. Because maybe the challenge is what kind of gets them out of out of bed or, you know, to, to kind of activate their bots. But again, it kind of made me got thinking about um, haters. So let's just quickly play this Meghan Markle thing and then you can I'll play the response from Kate, Katie Hopkins and you'll see what I kind of mean behind all this. But for me, I kind of seen a bit of a vapid look in her eyes. I think Meghan Markle's really going through it. And again, I don't think how you can, I don't see how you can watch this and not have any sympathy with her with her life at the moment. But, you know... I understand that it's just it's just difficult for regular people, even like myself maybe, to look at somebody that you know has this level of wealth, opportunity, freedom. I don't know, whatever. It's hard not to. 
I don't know. I don't, I don't find it difficult to have sympathy for celebrities. I don't. I, I think they're all human. I don't, I don't necessarily give a shit how, what you have or where you are or the job you do or the parents who the who your parents are or where you work it doesn't really matter like sympathy should be extended to everyone all humans right because we're all in this together i don't understand this idea that you can't say oh it's hard it's easy for you to say that kind of statement or what how you have sympathy for her she's got everything that she needs she's a fucking princess like yeah and she still has feelings you can't exactly go up. what do you what do you think if you, if you go up to her on, on the street and she's walking down the street and you just start hurling fucking abuse at her you think that's cool no, well, because she's a celebrity. That's none. That's insane. But anyway, here's a clip of her kind of speaking about the constant media uh, barrage she's been suffering from and what that's kind of done to her and affected her. And again, you can see, like, even just from her eyes, that she's kind of welling up and holding back the tears as she's talking. So again, it's like, imagine going from just being a regular LA celebrity, you know, I won't say me on the road, but just, you know, probably jumping around from TV series to TV series, maybe had a few movies lined up, and then suddenly your life gets upended, you know, in an instant once you meet this guy called Prince Harry. But anyway, let's play it here. Very concerned about protecting you and protecting you from what he felt his mother went through. It's obviously an area one has to tiptoe into very gently, but I don't know what the impact on your physical and mental health of all the pressure that you clearly feel under. Um, I would say... That blink was very knowing, isn't it? Like, that blink was like, man... You don't know the amount of times I've been crying, right? And I don't know, again, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's a Christian background growing up in a church. You just, you know, you tend to have a lot more sympathy for others. Or you tend to have a lot more forgiveness in general in your heart. You tend not to hold grudges. I don't, I don't hold, hmm, I'll take that one back. I think I do hold grudges, actually. As people now who, if I saw in real life, I'd, I'd probably still kick them in their face. So I can't say that, but... There is that kind of thing that I have in me where I just can't not, I can't help but feel sorry for people when they're going through shit. I don't just say, oh, fuck them. I can't do that. So maybe that's it. I don't know. But I, again, I don't know. Okay, let's just watch this and then we'll watch Kate Helper this thing. I'll play it for and stop stopping anyway. Look, any woman when they're, especially when they're pregnant, you're really vulnerable. And so that was made really challenging. And then when you have a newborn, I mean, you know, you mm -hmm. It's a long time ago, but I remember, yeah. yeah. You know, as, and especially as a woman, it's really, it's a lot. So you add this on top of just trying to be a new mom or trying to be a newlywed. It's, um, yeah, well, I guess, and also thank you for asking, because not many people have asked if I'm okay. But it's, um, it's a very real thing to be going through behind the scenes. And the answer is, would it be fair to say not really? okay since really been a struggle yes fuck man again how can you watch that and not have sympathy for this woman like i'm not really okay thanks for asking because no one's really asked that and that again goes to show just how for all the things that people say about celebrities and they get annoyed with them and all this sort of stuff in general in general I think I've, I've surmised, especially from the times I've seen of, you know, the counterculture stuff happening, especially within the streetwear scene, you see things, you recognize some stuff and you're really, I'm attuned, maybe because I'm, I'm from the scene and I kind of got my start up or my start from, you know, hanging out in Shoreditch and all that sort of stuff in Dawson. And I've seen, you know, I think London by and large scene wise is probably the hardest scene to kind of navigate in, right? There's a lot of ego, especially on the lower rungs, right? If you're just like, especially people that haven't done nothing. Because there's, 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 there's so little opportunities. Because there's so little ready-made opportunities, right? People tend to kind of like, you know, scratch each other's eyes out to get anywhere, right? Even if it's a fucking sales system job somewhere, right? Those things are all covered because everyone knows each platform provides an opportunity for something else, right? You work at Foot Patrol, you might that might be a good little part-time job because the person that manages it is this person or the person that might or the, is potentially a hot cool hotspot for this kind of person that might walk in you might give that person a demo who knows that person so everything is everything is something right on those ready-made platforms of course when you get older and you get more experience you realize that the only true way to be prosperous or to kind of achieve your dreams is to be physically um i don't know independent where you can kind of dictate your own future right you can have your future in your own hands create your own platform create your own brand um do your own thing essentially like empower yourself but when you're at that age and you're just starting you always tend to think that you have to go through these gates right these kind of gatekeepers have to kind of keep you oh man I need to give me a chance you need to give me a chance give me a chance but the older you get you realize you know what no one's give you a chance you need to make your own chances better than yourself and then generally as long as you do good by other people you should be fine um but you realize that you know in that world people pretend to be your friends 
which is fine, right? Because we're all playing this game, right? In order to get to where we need to get to. And everyone's kind of tolerating each other because he or she has something that you need. But then the moment you go through some real shit, or the moment you are into, you're in some real trouble, or the moment you need some real assistance, is the moment those kind of friends that you think are your friends automatically the list shrinks. And I can speak for it myself, right? Again, I don't, I don't necessarily... I'm not necessarily a good example of it because I'm not necessarily a friend guy. I don't keep contact with people. I don't maintain relationships. I don't meet people up apart from maybe two or three people. I don't meet anyone up. I don't. I just stay on my own. Um, I just do my own thing. But I know for me personally, having gone through that whole being a party promoter guy, my inbox was insane back then, right? I looked through some of it uh, recently and I went back to the time where I said, like, you know, put on events. It was insane about people that were like, my friends, just, you know, quote, unquote, my friends. The moment that stuff stopped and I wasn't a cool guy in the East anymore, is the moment those those messages dried up. Now, if I held if I held that friendship as, up as anything more than what it was, like a scene thing, it would kind of destroy me. But I didn't. I just thought I just knew exactly what it was. But that thing happens a lot. So then, when you're going through real stuff, it's no surprise no one's gonna say, "Oh, are you alright? How are you doing? Long time no see. Let's grab a drink." I'm not surprised, but it is quite eye opening to think that someone like Meghan Markle doesn't have that many people in her friendship circle in general. Maybe because of the fact that she's a princess now, it's a bit difficult. The fact that she lived in another country is a bit difficult too. But there's no, but again, it's no excuse really. But there's no one in her friendship group that she feels like, in the expanded friendship group, that they, she feels like are reaching out and asking if, she, if she's okay. Because she doesn't have anything that she can offer them anymore, right? She's not in their circle. She's not an actress. She doesn't know any agents anymore. Like there's nothing, you know what I mean? That's the, 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 the vapidness of those relationships. It's just like, which is why I maintain like, honestly, if you have real friends, keep a hold of them. The friends you've actually grown up with, the friends that have, you've known from school, the friends that you used to work with back in the day at some shitty retail jobs. Hold those friends really close to heart. The guy that you worked with at a, as a bar back one time, the guy that was all... Do you know I mean, those are your real friends. Those those kind of people, right? That want to hang out and just go to Weatherspoons and have a couple of drinks with you. The people that only want to hang out with you because you have a list to go to Boiler Room or because you're this kind of person aren't your real friends. They're just people that are just there for the good times. And once and once it gets, and when the rainy season approaches, there'll be nowhere to be found. So anyway, back onto the subject of Meghan Markle. She has this really, uh, um, 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 you know, gut-wrenching interview where she kind of opens up her heart and says, look, I'm not okay. Thank you for asking. And then of course, someone like Kate Hopkins jumps on Twitter and then this is her reply, right? Kate Hopkins is like, you know, the famous um, UK troll saw like in a similar vein as a uh, Milo Yiannopoulos and again let's just look at what she has to say regarding this issue it's a video here if it plays yes it is it's called hashtag we love you Megan right and of course it's like a snark thing no. she's in a garden um, and kind of you know mimicking the video that Meghan Markle did um, wearing a wig and just being a bit of a cunt really about it, isn't it? but hey what can you do so let's see what she has to say well, thanks for asking, Tom. And no, not many people ask if I'm okay. Not not the nanny or the second nanny, not the chauffeur, not the gardener, not the taxpayers who paid for my home, not the people who helped me fly all over the place on jets. No one asks if I'm okay, and I'm not okay. Um, you know, we're supposed not just to survive, but to thrive. You know, those things rhyme, so I know that they're right. And like I say to Harry, or as I call him, my bitch. golden ticket, um, you know, we just exist, which is like pissed, which is what I am with the royal family. Um, you know, I've just been around, all the way around South Africa as a mom, as a sister, as a daughter, as a sister of a daughter and of the wife of a daughter of a sister. And I've met and pretended to dance with women who've survived rape and uh, kids with HIV and people who have nothing. And what I've come away with is really thoughts about myself and how, um, you know, I didn't think this would be easy, but how it's not fair on me. And you know, it's all new. I'm a newlywed, I'm a new mum. It's hard being a newlywed and a new mum and being Megan. Um, so those things are tough. So yeah, uh, we'll see how that goes. Okay, did you say rep? We're done. Yeah, we're all finished. Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. I've got to go and post to Instagram. I've got holidays to take. Wimbledon, Serena, Beyonce wants me on stage. I've got a front cover of Vogue to do. Okay, so I'm going to go do those things. All right, so uh, remember, yeah, sad face. Okay, good, bye. So yeah, um, not funny in any way, but 
Um, going back to my comment regarding the hype beast, I think we have to get to a point where we start to see being a hater as just a thing that people want to do nowadays because it's just the I think internet the internet has evolved to a place where being a hater or being this kind of troll person is an actual occupation and has some kind and again excuse me for saying this but it has a validity and it has a value because I think if you see her if you see her replies after this um or her, her tweets after this Kaokins is like swimming in this hate she loves it she says the hate is her fuel it drives her um she's calling people ankle biters like little chihuahuas doesn't really care what you say like it's a constant like the only way that she she is able to uh, stay relevant or to keep herself in the limelight or to give herself more opportunities is to consistently feed that machine right she spews out some really wacky opinion or point of view on a subject that generally everyone agrees on people outrage it continues again look at Piers Morgan look at all these people they have this it's a it's a thing it's a it's a it's a skill it's an ability it's a talent I think maybe five or six years ago it would have been looked down upon as like oh you're just being a hater but I think nowadays but the internet has evolved to a place now enough where we have to assume that there is a portion of the internet, there's a portion of the people that use the internet or social media who like that kind of content. Um, there is a portion of, of the internet too that hate that kind of content. But if you put them together, it's quite a big portion. Let's say there's 50% of, 25% of people like it, 25% of people say hate it, and 50% are just indifferent. Just like me, you just keep, keep moving, right? If you see something you don't like, I've always abided by the idea that if you see something you don't like, just don't give it attention. I just don't share it, right? Um, just an easy way to just keep, you know, just, you know, my, my land, my line is signed, my line, my line, land, my line in the sand has been drawn and I just won't talk about it anymore. I won't share it. It's just not my thing. Cool. No problem. But I think some people have that reaction where they just have to voice their dis fact, dis disaffection for something, which is never really a good way to go about things because by and large, if you look to their Twitter feed, these same people are also enable there's not a balance between like what they like and what they don't like. So you're just spewing what you don't like, what you don't like, what you don't like, what you don't like. Because you're not telling anybody what you do like. So I think in general, going forward, we just need to accept that people like Piers and Kay Hopkins, all these kind of people are, do exist um, and just let them live. They have a particular audience that like their stuff, that hate their stuff, hate watch their stuff. And it's just going to continue until the world ends. It is what it is. It, 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 it's just evolved to that point. In the same vein as, you know, people, you know, wasting their time hating on hype beasts because they're buying up all the shoes and reselling them. It is what it is. The game is the game. Play it. Get a bot. Wake up early. Have two phones. Whatever it may be. Do what you can do to get the shoes. And now with StockX, you've got another option to get them. Uh, resale prices aren't what they were back in the day. Um, there's still a lot of Dunkers beats from 2000 era that are going for a lot more than stuff that's sold this year's. Like, there's not that many really expensive shoes. If you want something, you can get it if you want. So the fact that you're complaining about hype beasts is never gonna really going to change. And now the new generation are kind of taking that hype beast sticker or that kind of crown and putting it on themselves or that badge and say, yeah, I'm proud to be a hype beast. Everything I wear has to be limited edition. They don't give a shit. In the same vein, there's going to be kids coming up nowadays and saying, you know what? I'm just, I'm just going to hate everything. I'm just going to make a channel where I just hate completely everything. I'm going to take the con the contrarian view on every subject that comes up um, in media because it's quite fun to see your notification little number go up into the 99 pluses because people are just attacking you for saying, I don't know that you think Beyonce is overrated, right? It's too, too, Cause it's just too easy. People get too, e people are too easily triggered. So I don't really blame people like these kind of figures for like exploiting that kind of loophole. Cause again, especially in an era where people are spending so much money on Facebook ads, organic reach is not where it can be. To be able to garner that level of attention and that level of retweets and and get on the trending page or Twitter, it, it, it's, it's a bit of a skill, it's a bit of a talent. I know some people don't, wouldn't say that, but it's not easy to do. Just go and ask a big media company about how much they, how hard it is to get, a, or even a brand, how hard it is to get um, exposure or PR or placement on something that they're pushing out, a product or a service. It's not, it's not easy. It's not easy nowadays. Or to even get, get click throughs to your site. So if you're one, a one person ent entity, a one person machine like a K Hopkins, and you're able to constantly, um, um, constantly kind of trigger people and press that button on that outrage machine and get people riled up again and again. Because again, it's not like a shock thing. KLP always says something crazy. It's just part of her brand, isn't it? So if anything, people are, people are just getting drawn into the stupidness of it. It's like, she's going to keep doing that because that's what she does. Like, you getting outraged is not going to stop that. So again, let's just maybe understand that. And if you don't like it, just ignore it, innit? Like, I don't know. Well, what can I say? If you're a fan of Meghan Markle and not a fan of hers, just support Meghan Markle and don't support her. I don't know. That that would be what I would do. 
I wouldn't spend my time hate watching something. Like th- there's a video of some kid that went to a, a Danny Brown show and Danny Brown berated him because he was um, heckling the female warm up act. And I was like, who does that? Who goes to a who goes to a show? This is even different because I was gonna say you'd never go to a concert with somebody you don't like and then heckle them, would you? But this is even worse because it's like a warm up act, so you know you know exactly what the process or, or the procedure is at a concert, right? There's usually a DJ playing or some warm up acts before the main guy starts or the main guy or girl or band, right? Cool. So it's not as if like you're gonna hear this person for two hours. They're gonna play for like a twenty minutes or forty minutes. Just shut the fuck up, listen, or or don't go outside, have a cigarette, and then come back when you're when your guy's playing. But to stand there. And shout at the person or berate them while they're performing. It's a real cunty thing to do. But unfortunately, nowadays, those kind of people exist. And they like that kind of thing. They like to be the antagonist. It's like the kid that goes to a liberal rally wearing a fucking um, MAGA hat on. It's just one of those things. It's an easy trigger. You know you're going to get people riled up. So, I don't know. Just stop hate watching things. I don't know. Especially nowadays. There's so much stuff to watch. So much content out there. Why are you waste your time watching something you don't like? I never understood that. It's just such a waste of time. I don't know. Okay, so that that that's it on that one. Move on in, move on up. Do, 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 do. Business techno. This is a quite interesting art and call. Cool. I've seen this talked about a lot on the worst techno memes um Facebook page. If you're not part of it, I implore you to get on it. The worst techno memes Facebook page is fucking amazing. Really, some again. If you're a fan of memes, you'll like it. If not, you won't probably get it, and you'll probably think it's a bit stupid. But once you get into the lingo, you start figuring out what techno dust is or techno test te- techno dust is or, <laughs> or techno tapas and all that malarkey. You start to realize what what night. You start to see the nine meme about Sven in front of Bergheim like nine stein so you'll start to laugh about it but you know it can get it's hard to get but there's a lot of um themes about you know in general taking a piss about the stuff that's occurring re- now in the electronic music scene where it's taking ribbing at tech house or whatever it may be or electronic music or techno but there's been a term floating around that i've kind of seen said called business techno which i've kind of been consu- confused about what the term actually means at first i thought it was just a the idea of big room techno right um people playing at massive festivals with like ten thousand people in it right there is a brand of techno that works for that kind of stage that probably wouldn't work in a smaller festival or a smaller venue and there are certain artists that can play that sort of stuff right it's not a, it's not no even though i'm a big believer that all djs should be able to play all things right you should be able to have i believe that all the best djs should be able to have in their arsenal 30 to 40 minute set of each genre that they can just sling out right like a 30 foot like i know i've got a killer killer 30 disco i've got a killer 30 minute disco set a killer 30 30 minute hip-hop set a killer 30 minute house set and maybe a techno set at the moment but the aim is to get like an hour of each of them right that's where you know you're at the maximum proficiency because you're just going to be able to bang out this you know tight set of bangers that really work well but most of you just don't do that you know you specialize in your thing that you do you hone in your craft you get really good at it and you kind of expand from there so there are certain DJs that are able to play 10,000 uh venue 10,000 capacity venue places and people that are more uh, at home at like 500 venue 500 capacity venue places or little basement bars somewhere in the middle of berlin so there's different so i just assumed that that was what it was um but of course it's kind of evolved into this other thing about you know those djs are the ones that always have their hands in the air the ones that get sponsored by big brands blah 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 blah, blah. but mix mag put together a really cool article that kind of expounds on it and kind of details it really well and i thought i'd read it to you guys because i think it's quite interesting actually um it's called what the hell is business techno um it's here written by someone called nilofar hadira ha no haidari nilofi Nailufa Hadari. Nailufa Hadari. It's called What the Hell is Business Techno? Um, everyone's talking about business techno, but what is it and what does it want? An article from Mixmag, right? So I'll read it to you guys now. So as this is the article. If you, like many other friendless nerds, um, spend your days reading reviews, arguing with strangers under your favorite DJ's list, latest terrible opinion on Facebook, you probably already have heard business techno. Like most things, um, which is, you know what? Just before I carry on, that's the that's the weird thing about Facebook. The only reason why I'm still on it now is because of electronic music. Events, um, your favorite DJs, um, Facebook pages, keeping up to date with their releases. That's the only way that I do it through that because I've got a little I've got a little tag that I I um I kind of uh, put all my electronic music specific things on there where it's clubs, uh, club nights, DJs, labels, they're all in one just one little tag that I put that. So I click that and get the whole entire feed. But that's the only reason why I'm actively still on there. If not, I would I would have deleted it a long time ago to put my own events up on there. It's weird, isn't it? Like it's just because of that, not because of oh, I want to keep in touch with my old friends. I don't talk to anybody else on there. So it's like, hmm, 
Interesting. But anyway, it continues. Um, no one can quite agree on what on what it does, and it doesn't fall under its corporate umbrella. But depending on where you stand on the pressing political issue of DJ fees and the age-old debate between the mainstream, no, not, between age-old debate between the mainstream and the underground, referring to an artist of their uh, regard, 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 referring to an artist of their output as business techno is even insult implying they make. Uh, or play unimaginative sellout music or simply in lunchment at techno DJs are now finally able to become millionaires and travel on private jets. The term was coined in 2018, which is interesting, right? So a recent term by a Berlin-based producer shifted on Twitter in response to a fellow techno maker, Trun uh, Trunker, tweeting incredulously about an RA review of Ina Schneider's Prosperity EP, which starts off by claiming techno is the new tech house, which is fucking insane statement to make, right? Um, business. If you've ever been to a tech house party, you'll know that techno isn't for the same tech house. So it's not the same at all i think most people even the ones that are a bit freaked out by like ball gags and chokers and uh, i don't know um spandex and leather and you know whatever it may be and whips and shit and people fucking in dark rooms even those kind of people they must be aware that they, they must acknowledge that they would probably prefer to go to a really um f fucked up party somewhere in a basement somewhere in berlin and go to a tech house open air somewhere in the middle of Shoreditch. Honestly, you you much prefer that techno crowd than you would that tech house crowd. I'm not going to say why. If people are watching this know why. Listening, you know why. <laughs> anyway, um, it's weird. Um, and in response, he tweeted, business techno is a new tech house. Um, and a new micro genre, Come Insult, was born because if serious techno brothers believe in one thing, is that tech house is the worst genre of all time. As with everything bad and boring, there is a lot of money involved. It wouldn't make much sense for business techno to be broke, would it? Um, this, is a, this is a hill that Spanish DJ Rigo decided to die on or was crucified on anyway, regardless. In February 2018, on the Facebook update, oh, this is a really funny thing, <laughs> on the Facebook update that kicked off the techno as business uh, discussion, when he said he wanted to make techno music the new mainstream music, which is fucking insane statement to make, really, isn't it? To think that you have any kind of power or influence to make techno mainstream and to kind of suggest as if that it should be mainstream and to suggest that maybe, and to kind of put out there that maybe not a lot of people listen to it is nuts as well, regardless, right? His argument was that there was a big money being made by people pretending to be playing techno. So why shouldn't big techno be made by real techno DJs? It presumably did not occur to him that some people wouldn't agree his own boring big room output as real techno either, which is fucking insane. <laughs> oh, I love this article, man. This, this writer went in. Um, at the same time, as the international explosion of diverse artists using techno as a base for experimentation and aesthetic exploration, there is an accompanying wave of painting by numbers techno, which of course we've all heard. Techno for people who find their next night out via target Instagram adverts and timeout recommendations, which obviously is not a good thing. What people would uh, who don't like techno think techno is, the most obvious stereotype of the genre made manifest via strobe lights and spinning smiley face projections and exploited the truly wild amounts of money, which is very true. You know what's funny, actually? I'll do this all the time. I, I don't know. Maybe it's a troll thing. I just like to wind people up. Um, one time when I went to a party in South London, it was like this really cool, forward-thinking, um, I think LGBTQ-centered um, art gallery exhibition. Um, loads of, um, I, I'm, I'm going to say queer photographers, I'm pretty sure. Art collective, I forgot their names. Really cool exhibition for a gallery. And they had an after party, um, DJs playing and shit. And this is just when uh, To Pimp a Butterfly came out, a Country of the Mars album, right? And they were playing some tracks from there. I think they were playing a couple tracks from there or something. It was right when that was at the fervent place and people were making really hot takes on the social media. You know, the constant um, circle joke that surrounds Kendrick Lamar. I'm a big fan of his, but, you know, Kendrick Lamar fans are the ones that, you know, may might put you off him in general. Anyway, everyone was enjoying having a good time and I was there and everyone was having such a good time. I, I don't know, I just felt like just disrupting things a little bit. So everyone was like really kind of, you know, pumping their fists in the air and just going crazy for this new Kendrick Lamar album. And I was like bouncing along like smiling at it and some guy was like singing their own lyrics or some guy and girl like to me like you know mouth and lyrics to be like ah, whatever it might have been and i was like wow man this is really good isn't it who is this <laughs> like that <laughs> you should see a look at their faces their faces drop like you don't know who this is no nah, man this is really good stuff what is he new and this is obviously Kendrick Lamar playing and they were like oh it's Kendrick Lamar like, oh wow so i like just to be i just mix it up a little bit and i did the same thing i fold the other day at the Richie Horton event, um, we were in a t we were in the toilet waiting to go to the cubicles, and everyone was in a queue, like bouncing their head, bobbing their heads, and, and some guy next to me said, "Oh, what? It's the first time here." I was like, "Yeah, man, my first time, man. It's fucking awesome, isn't it? I love this fucking electronic music." And everyone looking at me, like, "What?" I was like, "Yeah, man, I, I heard it recommended on Time Out, so I thought I'd pop in." <laughs> the side eye. I don't know, I just like to mix up a little bit because you know, people take themselves too seriously in these spaces, and they think you know they're part of some you know cool underground 
you know, thing. But it's like these clubs are listed on RA. We've all got, everyone's got Spotify, you know. You're not that forward thinking, you know. Relax. Anyway, let's continue. Um, in a way, business techno DJs are like the fin doms of the electronic music world, making thousands of pounds, pushing people who can come to drink overpriced beer and worship at their clinical and relentless four to four altar. Big room techno is fast becoming a mainstay in UK clubbing experience. Clubs where you have to all but give up the right to have your firstborn child to enter after paying increasingly astronomical entry fees or to get a taste of Berlin and London, which is ugh. when you when you hear those statements made, especially if you've been to a place, I think mm, I think there's a thing if you don't travel often. You can sometimes think if you if you haven't been exposed to the real thing that that thing is taking inspiration from inspiration from it can be hard to what's yeah there's a band out at the moment that everyone's saying is copying Led Zeppelin right I forgot it's a, it's a young band um they all kind of look the same they got all, weirdly got the same faces and they got all these little trinkets on they kind of are a bit paint by numbers you know um rock in that respect right they kind of but they sort of like you know building on what Led Zeppelin has done. Now, if you have never been exposed to Led Zeppelin and you're a kid or whatever, a fan of music, it can be hard to see where everyone's coming from. But when you get exposed to Led Zeppelin, you listen to all their albums and you watch them live on YouTube and shit, you can then understand why people have such a strong reaction against the copycat brand. So when you have these events that are like, oh, it takes to Berlin in London and you book all these Berlin people and fly them over, um, it can be, it can be, it can be, um, what is it? It can be... I get why you'd think it would work that way, that, oh, yeah, we're getting a taste of Berlin in this space, but that's not what it's about. It's like, for all the things I love about Fold, I think the fact that they... Hmm. How do you say this? No, the fact that Fold is quite unlike Berlin, or uh, quite unlike Berghain, is the reason why it's really good. I think the moment they were trying to lean too much into the Berghain thing and be a little bit mysterious and all that sort of shit, it got a bit dead. But you can take the elements of the Bergheim thing that work and then apply it into a London setting and it works pretty well. Like everyone's fine with it, right? Um, I went there recently and it's a great place, but it doesn't feel like Ber Bergheim at all because if you've been to Bergheim, you know the Bergheim is nothing like that place, right? Um, and that's essentially what you should be doing. But I guess business techno in a way, they kind of, you know, you can imagine like a, a big corporate brand deciding to get some underground Ber Berlin DJ to come play at their event and then putting all chains everywhere and ho hoisting and speakers up in the air with cable chains and having industrial platforms on there just because they think that that's going to work but that's not necessarily what it's about it's about it's more than that there's an essence to it that you can't really extract or you can't copy and paste and put it into your event it's quite hard to talk it's quite hard to intangible really isn't it hard to describe you have to just be there and unless you've experienced it it's hard to kind of see what the fuss is about but again i totally understand this point right um Da, 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 da. and again the prices of things as well print works and all these even warehouse projects like 40 pound for a ticket you're like shit insane but again everything costs diff if they open a, a, a super club or a nightclub similar to like fabric in sweden i would expect it to also be 50 quid to get in because you know the cost of living there is a lot higher than it might be in a in like a shitty eastern european country but bloody hell man 40 quid to get into some of these clubs is like god almighty not including the drinks, not including whatever else you get after that. It's just like, it's a lot of money to go out and have a good time. A lot. Yeah, and you really have to commit to it too. And especially nowadays with, and even, more so in London, I don't know any other place. The amount of people that flake at events, the amount of tickets you see available on resale sites once the event is sold out is insane. People in London are so flip-flappy and inconsistent with their decisions. They don't stick with anything. And then by the time the event comes around, I'm not really on it anymore. It's like, oh, it's insane. Anyway, continue. Um, no one can really agree on what business techno is um uh with you know it when you hear it offered as up as explanation more often than anything else but it has but it has money and it's spreading um it's it's spreading it's spending the booking okay sorry let's start again my reading out loud is so horrible uh, excuse me no one can really agree on who or what business techno is um with you know but you know when you hear it offered up as an explanation more often than anything else but it has money and it's spending it and it's spending it booking the same DJs to play the same sets madly differently but generally the same crowds up week after week while using facial recognition technology as part of its entry process um much like superstar dj steve aoki and calvin harris the business techno sets are influences of techno electronic music they're hot 
They've made loads of Instagram followers and they are happy to lend their personal brand to corporate sponsorships. In contrast, Techno's historically underground roots, which I'm very proud of, which is it's similar to skateboarding, right? Techno's done a really good job of policing itself. Um, the people that are holding up the underground scene are still making loads of money. There's still examples of people that haven't sold their soul to corporate brands and are still, you know, living living a very affluent lifestyle, are able to control the amount of gigs they do. There's there's different kind of underground. You know what I like about underground electronic music, especially techno music, is that there are different levels of it. There are people that just play their own hometown city. There are people that tour maybe 100 dates a year. And there are also people that play 250 dates a year, right? You've got different people that you can look up to as a point of entry. You don't need to just see Steve Aoki. Oh, no, not Steve Aoki. You don't need to see like a... Uh, a Chris Liebling, right? That's not your only idol. There's loads of people that are fall under different sort of levels that you can kind of look at and say, oh, you know that Perk? I quite like Perk tracks. He's got his own little label. He plays these, all these cool gigs all over the place. He makes some cool music. He's got some good people signing these things and I like what he makes, right? And it's, you can you can have a different, you can have different people you can follow in a scene that you don't have to go straight to the person that has like the private jet with their name emblazoned on the side of it. I mean, it continues. Um, in contrast, techno historically the underground roots. These DJs are here to make money. When you land, um, when you land on where you land on regards to whether someone should make thirty thousand a plane and imagine to set a big festival, and if they should flog shoes in their spare time, probably decides which side of business techno you divide or you are on. It's important to add that there is also a misogynistic element to the discourse. When is when is there or not? In that there are a lot of artists who get accused of being business techno are young, attractive women. Eh. They I disagree. I don't think so. I think business techno is firmly placed at the feet of, you know, the big, boring, white male DJs for the most part, which is, you know, I, I don't think they would be offended by being called business techno either because I, I think those really popular uh, DJs who are mainly white, who are mainly come from a certain place and have been in the industry for like 25 years plus, they just want to make loads of money. I don't begrudge that. You know, they've, they've paid their dues. They played enough shitty sets as it is. They've done enough shitty releases where they just want to collect the check and keep it moving. Um, they've got kids and stuff. They've got a family you have to look after. I understand, but I don't think you can. But I think the girls that have come up, the Emily Lens, the Peggy Goose, the um, Charlotte the Wits, they've been accused of it only because of people's I, people's impression that they've kind of been an overnight success, or that they've, or that they've give get, they've got given so much so soon, right? Maybe they've not been overnight. I think all those DJs I just mentioned have been in the game for ten years plus. But it seems as if like most of the time you have to struggle for a good five, ten years, maybe making tracks or playing in empty rooms. And then you get your moment to shine and then it kind of cascades from there. But it seems that like these girls, even look at somebody compared to like a Jada G, right? Compared to her, they've kind of gone, right? Instagram followers, brand sponsorship, it's just gone insane. So people probably associate that with them because it's gone from like zero to like a hundred straight away, which again, isn't their fault. It's just more so a consequence of the industry. The fact the industry has been so long dominated by just one particular look of a DJ. You look at the, oh, have you looked at the fucking, you know what? Yeah, let's look at the, you know what? Let, let me, let's, let's get this example. Let's go on the resident advisor. I think I, I saw this the other day. I checked the resident advisor 2016 um, top DJ list, just, just out of curiosity, right? And it's so much different to what you would expect a list to look like nowadays. You couldn't get away with booking all these DJs at the same time. But this is what it kind of looked like back in the day, right? I'm going to get a list of it and see where, where it is. And you see that, like, everyone just looks the same. Same name, same everything, right? Let's go. So, I guess up on screen. So, this is a two, Resident Advisor 2016 DJ, top DJ list. Has Dixon number one, Jack Master number two, Taylor Levas, Masha Plex, Solomon, Adam Bayer, um, Arm, Bicep, Ben UFO, the Black Madonna, only the one girl in there so far. Uh, Patrick Turping, Mas, uh, Mosi Drum Ensemble, Ricardo Vela Lobos, Carl Cox, Scream, Ben Clock, the Martinez Brothers, Jamie Jones, Honey, Rod Had, uh, Eats Everything, Nina Kravitz, then number two, only two girls now. Manon Letuff, Seth Troxler, Joseph Caparetti, uh, Dennis Salter, Lauren Garnier, uh, Richie Horton, Senba, and Gerd Janssen in the top 30. Only two girls in the top 30. And the rest are just exactly who you expect to see them. Now, again, it's not about placing women specifically. It's not about having this. But I'm just saying, in terms of the general crowd that you'd see in an electronic music event, you can't tell me that everyone just looks like those top 30s that played it. You can't tell me that there's not more people out there making great electronic music that should be having that platform. But over time, things will change. So I think it's not being placed primarily on the feet of the women. It's just because they've blown up so quickly. I think if RA introduced their top DJ list nowadays, it would look completely different because people aren't... I think the fact that RA took away their top DJ list it annoyed me because, you know, you, you didn't... It was a quite a good way to kind of find out about new DJs that you hadn't heard of because a lot of the list, you had to have gone to an event 
to kind of be able to vote, I'm pretty sure. So you got to see a lot of kind of local heroes getting boosted up too. And also got to show you um, categorically who were the biggest DJs, right? The kind of like the ones that people wanted to see again and again and again, general consumer. But I think nowadays, if you uh, the good thing about it actually inadvertently is that it's kind of got people again to start being a little bit more, I don't know, supporting a lot more of their kind of local talent. Even someone like Amelia Lenz, like I'm pretty sure like she's got a lot of her love, a lot of her start from the, the, her, her hometown country kind of bigging her up, right? Charlotte Whip probably the same thing as well. So people are more adept or more prone now to kind of go out and seek new DJs or go out to new venues and see people they don't haven't heard of maybe before and maybe save their money to see big acts at festivals and shit. So I think this list will look a lot more different. So that that, that term, business techno being only prescribed to girls, I have a little bit, I'm not really sure of, and I, I would argue against that personally myself. But anyway, let's go back to the article. Uh, so um, uh, female counterpart, so it follows... Um, so um, it's important to add that there's also misogynistic elements of discourse and it's a lot of artists who are getting accused of being techno are young, attractive women, something that enrages men on the internet who prefer jerking off to the clip of both members of the Karen making a hand movement at the same time. Unsurprisingly, most of the biggest acts in the scene are men. Mm. I wouldn't say that most of the big, most, it's quite mixed now at the moment. Um, they are less likely to be attracted for being money or image focused than their female counterparts. Which again, I'm not too sure if that's true. It's not, I don't think it's a slight either for girls to be more image conscious. They have to be, right? They're girls. Like they have to, there's more stuff women have to worry about visually or as, I don't know, put yourself together than dudes that do. Dudes are disgusting, right? You just roll out of bed, not shower, go to the DJ set and no one's going to complain about your looks. But by and large, if you went to DJ and you're a woman and you hadn't, I don't know, washed your hair or done your makeup, there's probably going to be more, it's probably going to be as many girls in the comments saying, why didn't she wash her hair? As there are dudes, it's just something that people are going to say. It's just one of those things, isn't it? Different standards for different people. It's just what it is. Um, I don't think that's really fair to say that in that regard. And again, it's changing. It's gonna it's gonna take a while to change, but it's changing. I could be, I I, I would be um I wouldn't be remiss to say it's weird that you know with with techno being with techno being birthed or maybe being cultivated or some of the biggest stars or some of the more influential artists, Jeff Mills, all these kind of people, Derek Carter coming from places like Detroit. I could be remiss to say that why aren't there more black DJs playing techno music out there? Why is it when I go to a techno party, people are surprised to see me there? Or why is it when I go to a techno party that there's only a handful of people that look like me there? I could be remiss to saying that too, but I know it's going to change little by little. It takes time. It's not something that happens over time. It's not something that happens overnight. Um, and again, I think the female conversation has inadvertently helped everyone else. Black, brown, white, male, female. It's helped because it's now said, oh no, we need to shine a different light. And I think you've even seen it even Boiler Room. Have you seen how Boiler Room has always been quite forward thinking in that regard? Don't get me wrong. They've always kind of been um, at the forefront of exposing us to new little counterculture, subculture, whatever it may be. But now Boiler Room is actually actively going to the places that start the music and hosting boiler rooms there inviting their local dealers instead of kind of flying over foreigners to go play their the you know native fucking music in that country it's now done with it's now done with a lot more care and a lot more authenticity and again it takes time let people you know, let things evolve over time don't be so hasty anyway it continues now no one has more to say about business techno than internet music's very own old man yells at cloud scuba who seems to tweet about it every every four tweets presumably because somebody once called his own brand of bland business or otherwise techno business techno um in one of those in one of his numerous musings on the subject he defines it as a term made up by people who are jealous of other people making man more money than them uh, i don't think about sure as we all know anyone who dislikes generally revolutionary movements being turned into platforms for the shilling of corporate interest has historically simply been jealous of his offer helps you to sell out but then again many of the most vehement users of the term do seem to be DJs irked that their career hasn't quite taken off in a way that they once dreamed of. Like any put down that becomes a meme, it has become weaponized, a tool to suit the agenda of the person using it. But separate, but but separate the lazy jabs, but separate the lazy jabs, professional jealousy and blatant misogynist overtones, and what remains is actually innocent dismay and disillusionment. Business techno can't really need, be neatly defined by a sound or artist or venue or a type of hat but it can be boiled down to a mindset. Business techno is capitalism. It's luxury flats, investment opportunities, it's tickets only affordable to tourists, it's clubs where surveillance is more important than the genuine rave experience, it's exciting DJ spaces getting shut down and turned into Instagram-friendly gastro pubs, it's, it is that, um, it's that it's this that uh, is at the heart of the disdain for business techno, the idea that techno is a commodity and not a culture, which is, again, I have to, I have to agree. I think any rave you see where they say we're going to take the essence of this city and put it into this club is insane. And again, I think for the most part, 
I would say that I would say that business techno might be a good entry point to underground electronic music, but I don't think it is. I don't think you're gonna get many people coming into business techno or getting or liking that kind of music, right? You know the kind of people that you know the kind of people that are always around. You know the kind of like people that stand around the that stand in the DJ booth at Circle Local or DC Tent, right? Those kind of people that you know want to be in front of the camera and point into the crowd and shit as if like they're playing the music. There's nothing that rubs me up the wrong way more than that. Like you're not the talent here; you're just a friend of a friend. That's always kind of makes me annoyed. But that kind of person that's you know always fucking begging for the guest list or the VIP spots, I think that kind of person is never going to be a fan of electronic underground electronic music. They they want that. They want that kind of table service experience that you're not going to get in a, most techno clubs but you kind of get when you stand behind the dj booth right because you have an opportunity to kind of have your own drinks and you know nick the person's rider or you know sniff some cat under the decks or whatever it may be but i think what it does do is that it lets people know the kids coming up that there is a clear distinction between what you see at these big corporate events and what you see on the underground scene and i think it's more it's, it's more interesting it's more fun and um, you have more opportunity to actually meet some lifelong friends who you might end up cultivating the whole scene under or you might start a label with when you firstly go down the underground techno scene route. I think that's the most probably advantageous route. Go down the underground techno scene route, attend some warehouse parties, buy some fucking random person's uh, vinyl on Bandcamp or whatever, a digital release, and support that little by little. And then you'll be able to see that that is really where the essence of electronic music comes from. Those places where you can't really um, quantify or you can't really package what the, where the magic is. That's what makes that stuff beautiful. But the business techno stuff is a bit bland, isn't it? It's sort of like, um, it reminds me of the, it reminds me kind of tech house scene or maybe when new disco kind of got a bit bland when that was the sound everyone wanted. And you know what? I think of business techno. I think of it as the stuff that you might hear when you go to like a store launch event, right? Like that, per, like, you know what I'm saying? Like I've, I've done those kind of things in Shoreditch and they're, you know, waste of time, but that's where I imagine it because it's a corporate brand wanting to associate their brand with like this underground label oh no it's like a corporate brand wanting to this associate themselves with this underground scene and then wanting that music to kind of like basically paint by numbers like oh if we put this guy that looks you know and usually when you go to these store events there's always someone really wacky playing there right some dude with like crazy hair crazy piercings because that's what the business thinks is a representation of the scene Let's get this really weird looking person. No, no slight on them to go stand in the corner and play this sort of music. Have the lights um, dimmed to red and shit, right? Have a really wacky girl at the front of the queue, uh, at the door doing a guest list. And then suddenly we made this vibe. But then day to day, when you go out to that shop, there's, uh, that essence that they're trying to get from that DJ and from that door girl doesn't exist in the space. It does, it's not there. So that's why I think it kind of gets a bit weird. And it kind of gets a bit murky. But again, what do I know? What do I know? I think you guys should check out the article yourself. It's called Business Techno. It's on Mixmag. I'll link it in the show notes so you guys can check it out yourselves. But yeah, move on in, move on up. Business Techno isn't where it's at. You need to get exposed to the underground scene. Anyway, um, moving on in, moving on up. What should we go to now? Um, should we go to what should we do? Should we do another one? Gucci Mane? Hmm. Or should we leave that for Gucci Man? Leave that for another time, innit? Maybe, yeah, maybe leave Gucci Man for another time and then we'll go straight on to the oh, Cactus Plant Fly Market Air Force Ones. Have you guys seen these? These are quite nice, right? So, Cactus Plant Flea Market, right? Cactus Plant Flea Market, um, has collaborated with Nike once again. The second pair from their um collaboration run, I think the first was the Vapor Max. And again, I wasn't a fan of, I think I mentioned it previously before, but I'm not really a fan of the Vapor Max model. Um, I just don't think it suits my feet. I think because the bubbles kind of you know, uh, they don't protrude outwards when you're, when you're looking down, it kind of makes your foot look like it's floating. And because it's quite of a skinny silhouette with my fat feet, it doesn't really suit it too well. And again, I just don't like the model. Um, but I like the colorway. I like what they did with it. I like the friends and family um, LED sort of light thing they had on it. That looks fucking amazing. And just generally, as a collaboration, it looked like nothing you've seen before in the market. So again, um, kudos to them for putting that together. But I really like the second the second collaboration, right, um, that they put together here. That I, I think it looks really, really, really nice. So I take inspiration for the Nike Up Tempo that I'm not really a fan of, but I always wanted to wear. It's a little bit too boxy for me. Um, and I don't really, there's nothing that I wear in my wardrobe that would allow me to put that thing on, that kind of up-tempo sneaker on. But if you've seen what an up-tempo looks like, it's this thing, right? It's a, it's an amazing basketball trainer, to be honest. It looks really amazing. It's got kind of air written on the side of it. Um, really chunky, really chunky 
boxy kind of shoe it reminds it a little bit like of a mid top uh triple s or something right really metal shoe but visually it's really nice to look at first sort of like a phone posit visually i like it but when some feet they don't look anything they don't look cool whatsoever i don't care what anyone says look fucking horrendous but there is something about them um like this as an image the product looks amazing so cactus plant flower market were able to kind of take the essence of that shoe and place it on the air force one one of the best silhouettes out there you can't really go wrong and again really great i think nowadays i think the odd thing the, the great thing about collaboration nowadays is that most brands aren't just going for the wacky crazy option i think before when brands were collaborating with uh sneaker companies right the 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 thinking was that because manufacturing is so difficult to make your own shoes costs a lot of money so when you get the opportunity to really do a collaboration with a sneaker company like nike adidas reebok whoever they may be you really want to try and exhaust as many options as you can because it might be the only time you get to do a footwear right it might be an introduction to it and why not right you got the opportunity to do it but i think nowadays brands have matured enough to get to a point where they want the the collaborations to also mirror what they do in their own brand they don't want it they don't they want there to be a synergy you don't want it to be too wacky and too crazy because you, you'd be able to you walked into you know charlie um we want because chocolate chocolate factory right you just want to be able to you know do the same thing you do in your brand but echo it into into a shoe um and generally those shoes are the ones that do the best um i've got too many examples to think about on top of my head i can't think of them but i think this is a really brave decision to go and just take the air force one low in white and black emblazon it with flea air on the side or um what does it say sunship what does i say on the other side is it sun i don't know what it says on the black one but just to emblazon it with that on the side and nothing else is quite brave um there's some branding on the insole but apart from that there's no other thing that you can see on it no embellishment on the tongue nothing on the heel just the side on the start the stuff stuff on the, on the side and, and i think if anything they've un upgraded the materials on the upper so it is not the if you've ever bought air force ones from jd sports you know it's just like the shitty leather that you know you have to be careful not to walk too much in because they're going to completely crease this is sort of like a nice tumbled um tumbled leather sort of upper so you're going to have that nice kind of buttery leather that's going to um, age really well as you wear them often and again just very very simple there's nothing crazy on them just that or nothing crazy apart from big bubble letters written flea on the side of them but again i think it's a really it's at it's testament to like the current state of collaborations nowadays that this is just a normal thing to do just make a very tasteful collaboration nothing too crazy something that kind of um, works really well in conjunction with the stuff that you really got out at the moment in terms of your mainline brand and again i like it man it looks fucking awesome much for me much more up my alleyway than um, the, the vapor max i didn't really feel the vapor max was something that i'd wear and it was something that i also thought would kind of have a it the novelty would kind of wear off quite soon i don't know maybe it's just me um i think if you support the brand maybe it's a, something a bit different but i wasn't really a fan of it and if i was i'd maybe want to you know, if I was in LA and it was always sunny and I wore them with shorts all the time, that'd be quite sick. But to wear them in London, they don't really, I don't know. I don't know. I don't really get the sense of like light and sunship and earth and tones and nature with wearing them in London surrounded by fucking puddles and grey skies every day. But these Air Force Ones, right up my alleyway. So again, all white. Flea on one side and the white ones and air on the other side. Okay, so the white ones have flea and air on one side with the um, um, custom um, insoles. And then the black pair have sun, shine, uh, and air on the other side too, which is quite cool. So I like them. Um, great shoe. Um, again, F black Air Force Ones, white Air Force Ones. You're not you're not going to go wrong with me on that one. You're never going. I'm never not going to say they're a good shoe. Um, great collaboration, very tastefully done, and I can't wait to see when these come out. I think they're out already, isn't it, at the moment, right? Yeah, they came out on the 21st, so that was yes, a couple of days ago. So if you haven't got them already, then do have them soon. And um, there's also a capsule collection out as well that's going to do with them in terms of clothing and stuff. But again, these are probably my most um, interesting thing I've seen in the collaboration. Um, I like these the best. I think they're part of the Nike, what the, yeah, Nike Buy You thing that Heron Preston did. I'm not sure if that's just like an upgraded ID. I'm not sure what that thing is in general, but um, Nike Buy You, right? do you remember what, what is that yes i'm pretty sure it's like a nike color nike id thing i'm pretty sure that's what it is let's see what, what happy is tagged it as but i think it's like a nike id thing that they do like the luxe version of it i'm not too sure i think so anyway but anyway check it out yourselves um that is the cactus plant flea market nike bayou air force one it should be out already in most of the usual places i'm not sure how much it's actually going for let me see how, let me see actually how much it's going for on stock because it's going to be quite interesting to see <laughs> it's a really nice shoe because i think this along with in this one i mean the tasteful collaboration do, do you remember that um air force one that virgil did with the complex the white one so so nice that's really that's really my favorite of the whole thing and that's that wasn't even a collaboration that came out as part of the 10 project because I, I think that was only part of the 
That was for ComplexCon, isn't it? I'm pretty sure. That was the first ComplexCon they did that for. So it was like a limited release thing. They only released there. And people, you know, everyone was fighting and shit. So let's see how much they're actually going for on StockX, this, these shoes. But I'm pretty sure they're going for a lot of money. I'm not, I'm not going to be surprised if they aren't. If they're not going for a lot of money, I am going to be fucking shocked. Let's see here. Load it up. Let's see, let's see, let's see. But I think those two are, are the good example for me of like collaborations that I've just done really tastefully well. And again, maybe I'm biased because I love Air Force Ones, but I think that those are those that's that's the best way to do a collaboration in my experience. Just just do them in a really tasteful way that doesn't, you know, doesn't necessarily have all the bells and whistles that you know recently associated with this kind of thing. Let me see if I can find it. Is it here? No, it's not coming up. Cactus plant flower market. Let's see. <laughs> sneakers right let's see two results what have we got here oh it's not even out yet i don't know okay cool maybe they're not out yet so the only the vapor max is out so far i don't see anything else is out but why, why is it still date here it's gonna be out on the 21st where is it then where to buy you can buy it in a nike store really it's not gonna be available now is it no way custom nike air force one low cpfm let's see and again i think this is the virtual this is the one isn't it right um the off-white air force right complex come where is it air force, air force one this is the one i'm talking about where is it? it's the white one uh yeah this one this is the best one the af 100 right i think that's part of that it's going for three grand three thousand stock x that's insane but this is one of my favorite collaborations um out of especially of air force ones just really tastefully done in it look at that it's beautiful man basically a white air force one with a silver metallic solution inside of it uh a yellowed sole and a tongue from a i wouldn't say a blazer is that a blazer tongue so i'm not sure if it's a blazer tongue and obviously they were the kind of deconstructed bits that you're familiar with with the virgil shoe but they're so good man such a good shoe and look at how much the white air force one's going for even more so than the the MCA um, off white kind of collaboration shoe, and the black ones are still going for quite a lot of money as well. So yeah, one of my favorites out there, man. I'm like, oh, Def Jam Air Force Ones, Rockefeller ones, only going for one thirty three. That's insane. Um, so yeah, where are they? Are they available in there? No, they're not. Not so far. But anyway, we'll see them soon. Hope. Oh, that product isn't longer available. But again, if you if you want them, I'm pretty sure you'll know where to get them by now. Um, they should be available soon somewhere. If not. Just look at these pictures and enjoy them. And we all get L's out here. I'm sorry, friends. We all get L's out here. Cool. Anyway, let's move on. Move on. End the show there because an hour has passed and I've got to get off to work. So thank you again for tuning in to the Excellent Zinger Show. This has been episode number 240. As per usual, if you listen via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review. Helps people know the show and to kind of get it spread. If you feel like donating to really to get a new camera or to just support the show in general and buy me a beer, there's a link to the Patreon there as well. You can contribute to it. If you're watching via the YouTube, leave give me a like and subscribe uh, so you can come back again. Maybe like if you like the video. Maybe comment if you want to have something to say. And we'll see each other very again. Very again we'll see each other soon very very soon um click the link below to go to my website see the links regarding myself all my dj gigs all my blogs and all that stuff all that social media links you can find it there agostinozinga.com that's agostinozinga.com but until then i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe and all that malarkey bye bye bye